So uh, today's topic uh, is fixed income alternatives in a low yield environment. Um, okay, so first uh, some disclaimer up front. Uh, I'm not an investment professional. I wrote a book, but still just from a uh, average uh, investor's point of view. Um, everything I'm talking about today is just my personal opinion. And some of it is based on my, uh, my own experience. Some of it is based on research. Um, I don't have any relationship with any company that I'm mentioning today, uh, except as a customer. Uh, some companies I am a customer of, some companies I'm not a customer of. Uh, I do include some rates. Uh, the rates uh, have been gathered while I was preparing the presentation. Um, they're not necessarily from the same date, not necessarily consistent. They have uh, fluctuated since then, and they will continue to fluctuate. So hopefully that's uh, all understandable. Uh, if you have been investing in the last uh, 10, 12 years, uh, this is a phenomenon you have uh, no doubt have encountered. Uh, the bond yields have been lower and lower. Um, so ever since the financial crisis in, back in 2008, 2009, uh, when the Fed lowered the, uh, the short-term interest rate to zero, uh, and then the stock market crashed, uh, the uh, there is a flight to safety, so the bond yields also went lower. So the blue line here in the chart is the 10-year Treasury uh, yield. Uh, went as low as 2.1% in 2009, and everybody said, oh, wow, uh, you, uh, you know, it's never been this low. It's a historical low. Uh, rates have nowhere to go but higher. Uh, it did uh, go higher uh, shortly after, but then uh, the Fed uh, started uh, uh, what they call quantitative easing. Uh, and then they, uh, the yields went down and down, eventually down to 1.5%. People said, uh, oh, wow, the yields have nowhere to go but up. And then uh, there was a period uh, when people said, uh, oh, the Fed is going to taper. Taper meaning stop doing the quantitative easing thing. And then the interest, interest rate went up a little bit. And then the Fed came back and said, oh, no, 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 we're not tapering. Uh, we're uh, doing continuous uh, more rounds of quantitative easing. And then the, the bond yield went down. And so 1.5 was the previous low, went to 1.4. And then when the Fed started uh, raising interest rate for a little bit, and then we got the inverted yield curve. That's where you see the... Uh, uh, the 10 year rate was lower than the short term rate. They call it the inverted yield curve. And then the COVID hit, and then we got even lower than the previous low. So the lowest, the 10 year yield hit was 0.6%. How could that be possible? But it, it, it was a reality. So now the yield came up a little bit. Uh, where is it heading? Uh, we don't know. Is it another taper tantrum? Uh, just uh, heading up a little bit and then uh, going down again? It's a possibility. It, so, uh, so I think the reason to review this is just uh, when the interest is low, you never know whether it's going to go lower. Uh, interest rates in other countries have gone negative. Will the US go negative? It's a possibility. So uh, we are in this uh, low yield environment. Uh, don't, don't think that uh, it cannot last. It has to go higher. It may, we, may have, uh, we may be in this environment for a long time. So uh, what do we do? Uh, we come to this talk about fixed income alternatives. Well, but it's still, we're talking about alternatives. The default option is just to stay the course because uh, we are uh, bogleheads. Uh, stay the course is our mantra. And uh, the yield is low, not because uh, somebody mandated it being low. Um, if you, uh, you've been a bogleheads, you uh, read something about finance, you probably heard that there is a inverse relationship between bond prices and bond yields. Um, it's a mathematical relationship. For any given bond, if you tell me its price, I can tell you its yield. If you tell me its yield, I can tell you its price. So the yield is a direct reflection of the bond prices. 
the institution investors, they're trading bonds, they're paying uh, these high prices, and then that the high prices translate into a low yield. So we're seeing, they're paying, they're seeing, they're getting the low yield by paying high prices. If the prices are good enough for them, uh, it's got to be good enough for us. And uh, this, this is not the first time we're in a low yield environment. We have been in a low yield environment for at least 10 years. And if you look at the chart, uh, this is the um, annual total return of the Vanguard Total Bond Market Index Fund. Uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 years, it's not that bad. Uh, average return was 4.6%, um, while, the, while the yield was, what, 2%, 1.5, 1.4, got down to 0.6%. So it's not that bad. Um, there were two bad years, uh, 2015 and uh, 2018. Uh, poor returns, but still positive. So bonds, the total bond market index fund didn't lose, didn't even lose money. And in 2019, it was above 8%. In 2020, it was above 7%. So it's staying in bond funds is not necessarily going to be, uh, be poor. Um, and for uh, all its fault, uh, a bond fund is very liquid. So if you need to rebalance, it's very easy. You just uh, sell the bond fund and buy socks. So during the market crash, uh, you know, selling those bonds and buying stocks yielded a good return uh, on the, um, on the uh, 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 recovery on the stock market. But the high return uh, was uh, pulling future returns into the current. So if you have a bond that paid 2%, and how, did, how do you get 7% in one year? You get 7% by shifting some of the returns in the future years into the current year. So that means you get 7% this year, but then going forward, uh, you may be getting only 1%. So you're, if you are not satisfied with the 1% going forward, then we're talking about alternatives today. So my contention for the alternatives is that we have to look for opportunities unique to us as retail investors, because the low rates, low yield is not a problem only for us. It's a problem for everyone. Uh, if you think that we're you know, wondering what should we do, uh, for our $500,000 investment in fixed income. A bond manager, they're dealing with 500 million or 50 billion in fixed income. So if you're thinking, oh, treasuries are bad, we, we should go to corporate, or uh, corporates are bad, we should go to high yield, or we should, uh, we should go to a short term versus long term, um, because if uh, interest rates go up, short term will be, you know, uh, better shielded, or if we should go to long-term versus short-term because the rates are going to continue to go low. If we're going, uh, we should go international, we should go emerging markets. All these issues are actively dealt with by the institutional investors. They're facing these issues. They're trying to figure out where they should go. And by their action, we're seeing the bond prices uh, for what they are. So we're only price takers. There won't be any places obvious for us. Oh, there, there is the bargain. We should go there. So we have to find places that are unique to us. So uh, if you heard Sam talk about it in the previous round of low yields, the unique opportunities to us as retail investors are primary, were primarily uh, in the direct CDs, being CDs sold by banks and primarily by uh, credit unions. So back in 2013, uh, we were able to get 3% CD for five years from Pentagon Federal Credit Union. Back in 2015, uh, I was able to get a three-year CD paying 3% from Northwest Credit Union. But today, if you're looking for CDs from credit unions, uh, I went to depositaccounts.com. I saw the best five-year CD today was uh, only, is only paying 1.3%. So the banks and credit unions are no longer offering the, better, the good deals uh, like they used to. 
because they have a lot of money. They, they don't need money, so they don't need to offer the attractive rates uh, to us. So what are the opportunities unique to us today? Uh, I'm gonna present four ideas today. The first idea is refinance and prepay our mortgage. So if you have a mortgage, if you're able to pay it off, pay it off. If you are not able to pay it off, refinance and then start prepaying. Um, people say, hey, mortgage rates are also historical low. Uh, yes, they're low, but chances are they're still higher uh, than the safer bonds because if uh, institutional investors, if they're able to get higher yields from bonds, they're not going to buy the mortgages. Uh, if they're not buying the mortgages, then the mortgage rates will not be as low as you see. So, and then um, from since 2018, um, there is a uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, also referred to as Trump's uh, tax cut. So they limited uh, the SALT deduction. SALT, the SALT deduction is the state and local taxes. So I'm presenting to the California group. California is famous for its high taxes. The California state income tax and property tax, uh, they are capped uh, to $10,000. So no matter how much you pay uh, in the state and local taxes, you're capped to a $10,000 deduction. And that made 90% of the taxpayers use the standard deduction. So when I was in uh, California uh, since 2018, uh, I was paying uh, using this, I shifted uh, into using the standard deduction. And that means um, the mortgage interest rate, uh, the mortgage interest you pay, if you use a standard deduction, you're not getting any extra deduction. So you're not, uh, it's not tax deductible. And also uh, the law since 2018 capped the amount of the mortgage uh, that counts uh, toward the mortgage interest deduction. So if you bought your home more recently, it, especially in California, it's more expensive, then the extra mortgage that you're, car that you're carrying uh, is not effectively uh, tax deductible. Um, and then uh, I hear people say, I don't want to pay off my mortgage or pay down my mortgage because I don't want to put more money into the home. Well, that, that boat sailed a long time ago. Uh, your, your home doesn't know whether you have a mortgage. Whether it, the value goes down or up, it's based on the home values. It, it's not tied to how much you have in your mortgage. So paying off your mortgage or not paying off your mortgage does not affect uh, your, the, the fluctuation of your home values. Um, and of course, um, you get uh, uh, more resilience uh, when you don't have a mortgage. Your monthly outgoing, your required monthly uh, payments are low. So if you have any loss of income or if you're considering retiring, then you don't have a, a, a high monthly payment that you have to make every, uh, every month. And then people, uh, of course, uh, feel good about you know, owning their home free and clear. Uh, the downside of uh, paying off your mortgage and refinance uh, is that you can only use your taxable money to prepay the mortgage. If you have to take money out of your IRA, if it's a traditional IRA, you have to pay taxes, that's not worth it. If you have to take out money from your Roth IRA, then you, uh, you're you using your uh, tax-free compounding uh, to pay off a mortgage, and that's not worth it either. So if you can do this only if you have taxable money and then you still have to you know have some uh, liquidity to deal with other emergencies so don't dump all your your all your investments into uh, into your mortgage um so second idea is called a fixed deferred annuity or a multi-year guaranteed annuity uh it's uh uh, it's, it, it is an annuity officially, um, but it's uh, least uh, like any annuity that we normally uh, understand of annuities. It's not an income annuity, uh, meaning that you're not getting any income from the insurance company. Um, it's not a uh, variable annuity, uh, which we normally understand is just an ex expensive wrapper to buy uh, mutual funds. Um, it's not a, a fixed index annuity, uh, meaning that uh, it's tied to some kind of index with a floor, with a cap, and uh, participation ratio, and all that complexity. Um, it's 
in the simple uh, term, it's more behaving like a CD. It's a contract uh, issued by an insurance company. It pays a fixed interest rate for a fixed term. So you have a 3% uh, annuity for five years. That's uh, as simple as that. Um, the selling point of this MIGA is, is just uh, its rate is higher than the bonds and CDs that you see. Obviously, there are also downsides. Uh, downsides is unlike a CD, uh, you don't have FDIC insurance. Uh, there is no uh, any uh, government agency guaranteeing this. You have a guarantee. The guarantee is only uh, by the insurance company. And it's not liquid. Um, there is usually a high uh, early withdrawal penalty and what they call a surrender charge. So for example, uh, I bought an annuity uh, like this. Uh, if I withdraw within the first year, then I have to pay 9% of the principal value as the surrender charge. So that means I'm not going to withdraw in the first year, not in the first, you know, throughout its term. I have to be committed to not withdraw at all. Uh, that means that you cannot use it for rebalancing. Uh, and also, it's an individual contract between me and one insurance company. Uh, it's not available as a fund. Some 401k plans have a stable value fund that invests in some contracts like this, but outside of a 401k plan, you're not able to buy a fund that uh, has multiple contracts uh, in one product. Okay, um, so the selling point is really higher interest rates. So here are some of the rates I gathered. Uh, three year, five year, and seven year, those are more common uh, terms of these uh, MIGA uh, annuities. And then based on the, the strength of the insurance companies, uh, insurance companies are rated. Um, uh, the common rating is by a company called AM Best. So they're, the strongest company is called rated uh, A++, then it goes down to A+, A, A-, minus, B++, B-, minus, B, uh, and so on. So I'm comparing the rate uh, with the best CD uh, that I, I see on depositaccounts.com and also with the treasury yields. So if you read this chart, if you read from top to bottom, uh, look at three year, you see from the rates go up as the insurance company uh, rating goes down. And that's obvious because if I'm a strong ins insurance company, then I don't have to offer as high a rate. Then if I'm a weaker uh, insurance company, then I have to offer a higher rate to attract customers to buy my annuity versus buying the A++ rated company's annuity. And you will see uh, the rate uh, is higher than the CD rate and uh, also higher than the treasury uh, yield. Uh, but, uh, and if you read the uh, rates across from left to right, you will see in general, uh, the rates are higher the longer that you, you're committed. And that's also obvious. If you, the insurance, gonna, uh, insurance company is gonna tie up your money for seven years, then uh, you want a higher rate. But it's not necessarily always true. For example, if you read the A-rated uh, insurance company, uh, there is a company offering a five-year MIGA for 2.7, but then the best uh, seven-year MIGA uh, for A-rated, you can only get 2.3. So uh, you can gather the rates, but you have to decide whether this higher rate is uh, worth it for you to tie up your money and worth it for you to lose the FDIC insurance uh, versus buying a CD. Uh, to me, it was worth it, but you have to make that decision uh, yourself. Um, you can uh, buy the MIGA in two ways. Uh, it's called qualified or non-qualified. Uh, qualified, it just means you use your money uh, in your existing traditional or Roth IRA. So you transfer part of your IRA to the insurance company. Uh, the insurance company becomes a custodian for your IRA. And then uh, after your term is uh, ending, uh, ends uh, at seven years or five years, you still have your IRA and you tell the insurance company to transfer back. So uh, throughout this uh, whole deal, uh, when you have a traditional IRA, you still have a traditional IRA. When you have a Roth IRA, still you have your Roth IRA. Uh, when it's all said and done, your traditional or Roth IRA is back uh, to where it was before. 
And then the second way to buy a MIGA is a, uh, a non-qualified, just means that you use your money in your taxable account. Uh, when you buy a MIGA, there is no tax deduction. Um, so you're not, it's not an IRA. Uh, you're not limited by the annual IRA contribution limit. You can buy, you know, 100,000, 500,000 if you want to. And then the earnings are tax deferred, meaning that if you buy a five-year MIGA, uh, each of the, in each of the five years, you're not paying. Uh, you're, uh, you're paying tax only when you take the money out. Uh, but if you do take the money out, uh, if you are before 59 and a half, then there is a tax penalty. So this is uh, similar to a non-deductible IRA. It's not an IRA, uh, but the behavior is similar to a non-deductible IRA, meaning the earnings are tax deferred. And then there is a tax penalty if you take the earnings out before 59 and a half. Uh, so federal uh, has a 10% penalty. California has a 2.5% penalty. Um, when your five-year or seven-year or three-year ends, uh, then you can decide, um, I'm going to take the money out. Uh, if you're already 59 and a half by then, you just pay the taxes, no penalty. If you are uh, under 59 and a half by that time, then you can still decide, I'm just going to uh, pay the penalty uh, because the interest rate is higher. You can do that. Or you can say, I'm uh, going to continue. I want to renew and um, I want to get into another MIGA or another insurance uh, type of product. It's called a 1035 exchange. And then your tax defer uh, deferral is going to continue. So you don't pay tax then. It's rolled into that new product. And then when the new product ends, hopefully by then you're 59 and a half, then you, you're out of that penalty period. Um, so regardless how many times you roll over from one MIGA to another, uh, it's still not an IRA, it's never an IRA, you can never get, it, get that into an IRA. So the one downside I mentioned, it's not guaranteed by a government agency. It's only uh, guaranteed by the insurance company. But then the insurance companies together, uh, they form this uh, guarantee association. It's a private association, no government affiliation. It's just all the insurance companies doing business in a specific state they come together, they form this association. And then they say, if one of our members uh, fails and they're not able to pay by the end of the term, then collectively all the insurance companies, uh, are gonna, they're going to uh, give you some kind of a guarantee. Um, the association is, uh, there is a single association by each state. So when the insurance company fails, uh, you are going to the insurance, uh, this guarantee association of your state uh, to claim uh, this guarantee. So if you bought a MIGA in California, but you moved to Nevada, and then the insurance company failed, then you are claiming against Nevada Association. But then the company has to be a member of that association. If the company that you bought uh, in California uh, was authorized to do business in California, they're a member of the California Association, but they're not the member of, a, uh, of the Nevada Association, then the association doesn't cover you. So you have to be uh, cognizant of that. And then the rules of each association is made by themselves. And there are some laws uh, in each state. You're going, you're going by the rules of that specific association. Um, I'm speaking to a California group. California happens to be a, a, a weak, a, has some the weakest guarantee in the country. So in California, the association guarantees 80% of the value. So you have to take a 20% head haircut if the insurance company fails. And then for the 80%, they guarantee you up to a maximum of $200,000 per person. And then there is also a lifetime guarantee, uh, a limit uh, for $300,000 per person. So if you had one company failed and then you took a 20% haircut, the insurance uh, guarantee association paid you 250 and then your next company fails, then you only have a 50,000 cap. Uh, uh, in terms of guarantee. So in general, I don't see this uh, guarantee association as much of a guarantee. Uh, obviously the terms are better in other states, but uh, you're, you're better off treating it as 
as a surprise. Uh, if it fails and you're getting some guarantee, okay, lucky you. But when you go when you go into it, uh, you need to you know may treat that as non-existent and really uh, think about do you, do I want to do this? It's the insurance company. Is it sound? Um, you know, am I okay giving this insurance company for you know my money for five years? Um, so the if uh, you lock in your money for five years, seven years, or three years, and if you need some money uh, before the term ends, some contracts will allow you uh, some limited uh, withdrawal without penalty. Uh, this varies by product, so you have to read the terms uh, for each product that you buy. Um, so, for example, uh, some contracts can allow you to withdraw your interest, uh, interest being 2 point, you know, X percent. Um, so all the accrued interest, if you need to withdraw, they allow you to take out the interest, but principal has to stay. Uh, or uh, some contracts will allow you to take 10% of the value each year. And then the 10% calculation also varies from product to product. Some will calculate only based on year end values. So in year two, you're basing the 10% of the value as of December 31st of the first year. In year three, you're basing off the value uh, uh, as of December 31st of year two. Uh, or some companies will say 10% of value whenever you take it, it's the value immediately before. Um, so you have to read the terms. And some contracts don't allow any withdrawal uh, period. So if you need to withdraw, then they assess the early withdrawal penalty. It's very heavy. Um, so I already mentioned this on one of the contracts that I bought. Uh, if you have to withdraw before uh, the term ends, you have to pay 9% in year one, 8% in year two, 7% in year three. So very heavy. So again, uh, treat this uh, early withdrawal again as a surprise uh, going in. Assume that you will not withdraw and assume you're, you're not allowed to withdraw. And if you happen to be able to withdraw, okay, fine. You're able to withdraw a little bit. Um, and then there is a uh, something called a market value adjustment, uh, just like a bond. If you want to withdraw and the prevailing uh, interest rate, uh, interest rates have gone up and the bond value is down, then the, they're going to uh, again take another haircut off the value that you can withdraw. And um, uh, if you happen to die uh, during the term. Uh, some contracts uh, will give the full value to the beneficiary. Some contracts uh, will will not, and they'll say the all the surrender charge and the market value adjustment will still apply. So uh, again, if you this you, you are thinking of uh, you know, wanting to withdraw, read the terms and choose a product that has better terms uh, that will allow you to withdraw a little bit, give you some flexibility. So what happens uh, when the term ends? Um, some products will auto renew just like a CD. If you have a five year MIGA, if you don't do anything, it's gonna renew to another five year. Uh, the rates uh, will be the rates uh, you know, uh, offered at that time. And some products will not auto renew and they wait for your instructions, uh, sort of turns into a savings account. They'll have some minimum interest. Um, so if your product was earning 2.5%, it may be earning only 0.5% waiting for your instructions. Um, so if you buy MIGA, you should set a reminder of uh, when the term ends uh, 30 days before. You got to tell the insurance company what you want to do. So if you have a, a qualified MIGA, you use your IRA money, you tell them, uh, I want to transfer back to my IRA or uh, I want to see what rates you're offering at this time. I want to renew or I want to cash out uh, or I want to go to another insurance company. You have to tell them what to do. And then if you give uh, them the instructions and then they'll probably process uh, your cash out or renewal or transfer after the term ends. Um, so if you're interested in buying, uh, realize Vanguard doesn't sell them. Uh, Fidelity and Schwab uh, sells them, some of them. Uh, if you get my presentation off uh, South Bay Bogleheads, uh, the link, uh, the 
green uh, links are linking directly to the page on Fidelity and Schwab's website. And you can read the products there, the rates uh, there. So the uh, Fidelity and Schwab uh, tend to offer MIGAs from some higher rated companies. They're A plus or A plus plus rated companies. Um, they're not the same companies. So Fidelity has a set of companies that they sell. Schwab has a set of companies that they sell. Uh, but in general, uh, it's convenient if you already have a Fidelity or Schwab account, but they're not necessarily the high rates. And then uh, there are some agents, insurance agents, uh, they, they specialize in this. So they set up an online presence, they represent multiple companies. Uh, they have the range from A++, A+, A++, A++, A++ and B++ companies. So they're able to offer higher rates from the lower rated companies. Um, again, uh, there are three companies here. Uh, I'm linking them in the presentation. Uh, Blueprint Income, Stan the Annuity Man, and then another company called immediateannuities.com. Um, they uh, offer different sets of companies. So, so they represent different companies. There are some overlap, um, but they're not necessarily the same. So some, some insurance companies may be offered only at Blueprint and other insurance companies may be only available at Stan and so on. So if you want to research this, check out all three companies, compare their products, compare the insurance companies and ratings. Um, there are two other companies. Uh, they're not available from California, but uh, uh, since today we have people from other states, I mentioned them here. Uh, a company called Gamebridge and Canvas. They're a, a captive agent, uh, just like your Allstate agents only sell uh, insurance from Allstate. So they each represent their parent company. Uh, it's just one company. They only sell their own company's products. They don't sell any, anybody else's. Uh, the benefit of that is because they're selling directly, uh, their rates are higher than the same rated uh, companies offered at uh, Blueprint and Stan and the immediateannuities.com. Uh, each of their parent is a B++ rated company. So if you're interested in B++, also check out Gamebridge and Canvas uh, when you're not in California. And uh, finally, uh, if you have relationship with some you know, brick and mortar uh, life insurance agents, uh, they may represent some companies as well. And again, it's the relationship is one to one or one to many. Uh, agent has to establish the relationship with the insurance company in order to sell uh, the product. So your brick and mortar life insurance agents may have some relationship with the company uh, not represented by Blueprint, Stan, or immediateannuities.com, or uh, they have some limited sets and then their rates may be better or worse. Um, so I bought a MIGA, so I'm uh, uh, giving you the process. Uh, I bought a MIGA through blue, uh, Blueprint Income. So I started with a online application, and then when you buy a MIGA, they want to they want uh, you to give them a high level financial profile, meaning that how much money you have in your IRA, how much money in your taxable accounts. You don't have to be exact. You don't have to tell them where you have the money. Uh, a close approximate, uh, approximation would be okay. Uh, they're doing that uh, to cover themselves um, so, so that they, they can show that you understand what you're doing, you have, you have liquidity, uh, you know you're tying up your money, uh, you understand that uh, there is a high penalty uh, if you need to withdraw money earlier. And then uh, the insurance company, uh, at least the company that I bought from, required the agent to actually make a phone call, actually talk to me and confirm that I know what I'm doing. I understand uh, I'm tying up my money. Uh, I understand if I uh, withdraw my money before, uh, before the term ends that I have to pay a uh, high surrender charge. So they did that. And then um, I had to sign some forms. So all those forms were sent via either DocuSign or some of the forms uh, I have to sign physically. And then I scan the forms and email them back. And uh, because I bought uh, a qualified MIGA, meaning that I used my money in my IRA, so I was uh, 
uh, transferring uh, some money from my uh, Fidelity IRA to the insurance company. So I sold uh, my bond funds into cash, waiting for the transfer. And then the insurance company uh, sent the transfer IRA transfer form to Fidelity. Uh, it was a partial transfer saying I, I was transferring this amount. And then the Fidelity trans process transfer uh, took a week. And then the insurance company got the money. They issued the contract. So they... Um, uh, they send the contract through the agent, and the contract is like a, a binder, uh, like this. Let's see where you can see this, uh, like this. Uh, many, many pages, <laughs> uh, this uh, physical uh, paper contract. And then the agent uh, sent to me uh, via FedEx. So the whole process uh, took about, you know, I, I would say four weeks. Um, but the rate uh, was locked uh, when I uh, initiated the application, when the insurance company uh, received the application. So if the rate, uh, the, the rate lowered uh, when they offered uh, new applicants, uh, I was able to still uh, get the old rate. Um, so uh, I got the contract. So uh, how do I know how much it's worth uh, at any point of time? Uh, some companies uh, have a client portal uh, in that you have your contract number, you go to the insurance company website, you can register, you have a username, and then uh, just like your online banking site, you go in there and, and anytime it'll show you the current value. Uh, some insurance companies uh, don't even have a client portal. Uh, like this contract I just showed you, they don't have any uh, portal at all. So the only way that you can see how much value this contract is worth after one year, two year, and three years is only by there is a printout included in the contract or because the rate is fixed anyway. So you can, you can easily calculate uh, the value by a spreadsheet. So you will, if you want to know, okay, now it's you know, 15 months after I bought it, uh, how much is it worth? So if you, you're tracking it, uh, your net worth through some spreadsheet or Quicken, uh, whatever, uh, you can use that value. Um, for a qualified MIGA, uh, the insurance company will send this uh, IRS uh, 5498 form uh, uh, showing the end of year value. Uh, you can keep that uh, just for your records. And then the agent uh, said, uh, I can ask them uh, you know, what my value is uh, at any point of time. Um, uh, I didn't bother. I just go by the spreadsheet. So uh, should you buy MIGA or uh, not buy MIGA? Um, I said the default option uh, is to stick to the bond funds. So default would be not buying a MIGA. Uh, if you do consider buying a MIGA, uh, it's not all or nothing. So make it part of your diversified fixed income holdings. Uh, because of the, uh, you know, uh, poor liquidity uh, and high uh, surrender charges. So make sure that there is absolutely no possibility that you will need the money before the term ends. And then uh, between the rating and the yield, you have to make that call. The lower rated company pays higher, a higher rated company pays lower. So, but if you go too low, then if it defaults, then you're getting into that guarantee association situation. The association may or may not pay, especially in California, you have to take the 20% haircut first before there is any possibility that the insurance, the guarantee association will pay. So if you go too weak, that's probably not a good idea. So pick a point, pick your comfort level. Uh, not buying is perfectly fine. Um, Every contract is different. So if you want to buy, don't assume. Uh, don't assume that uh, this contract allows the early withdrawal and then that, com that contract has to also allow the same. Uh, it's, they're, not, they're not the same. So make sure that you, you understand everything before you buy. Um, have an exit plan. So decide whether you want to buy uh, a MIGA in, with your IRA or with your taxable money. Uh, what are you, what's your plan after the term ends? If you are under 59 and a half, if you're using non-qualified money to buy it, then when the term ends, you're not yet 59 and a half. If you cash out at that time, then you're going to pay 
uh, penalty. Uh, and if the MIGA rates are not uh, as good at that time, then you're in a bind. So personally, I chose to um, buy with IRA money. It's just simpler. It's an IRA. Uh, if the terms are good at that time, I can renew to another MIGA, or I can just take it back uh, to my you know, broker. Uh, if you're using your taxable money, if you're already 59 and a half, then you have, you have the option just to cash out. Um, if you're going to buy, also consider uh, diversifying among different insurers and different terms. So maybe buy a three-year, buy a five-year, buy a seven-year from different companies. So at least you have some diversification just in case uh, one company fails. Uh, if you want to research this, our Bogle has wiki has a uh, entry uh, fixed annuity. Again, if you get this uh, presentation, it's linked to the Bogle uh, Bogle has wiki. Uh, our uh, Bogle has member Evelyn, uh, she uh, wrote very detailed notes uh, as a Google Doc. Uh, she shared it with everybody. Uh, so again, I linked it there. And then uh, if you go on Bogle has forum, uh, you can just uh, search for Maiga. Uh, there, there, are, there are some threads and very good information there. Uh, my next uh, alternative is a Series I savings bonds. So many of you, many of you may have been already familiar with uh, uh, save a Series I savings bond, uh, also called I bonds. Um, so it's going to be a review. Some of you uh, may not be uh, familiar. So uh, the Series I savings bonds is. is uh, uh, are issued by the US government directly to us, to individual investors. So institutions, and they don't get to participate. Um, and for that reason, you're not able to get it from the bank or broker. You have to go to the US government. Um, you have a very flexible term. Um, you can buy an I bond and then hold it for one year, or you can hold it for 30 years. Uh, I started uh, buying I bonds since 2001. So the oldest bond is already 20 years. Um, today, uh, the bonds that you buy are guaranteed to match inflation. In the past, some older I bonds have uh, you know, positive uh, above inflation rates. Uh, downside of I bonds, uh, it's not available in IRA. So you can only use your taxable money to buy them. Uh, and then because it's such a good deal to individual investors, the government uh, puts a limit. Uh, the, the, there is an annual purchase limit. Um, you cannot dump $500,000 in one shot into I-bonds. So you must build your position over time. So you buy $10,000 this year, $10,000 next year, and build your positions. Um, so may not be a good option for retirees and you know thinking that their $500,000 in fixed income are not earning a good rate and they want to go into I bonds. But for a accumulator, if you're still working, you're young, you know, uh, buying I bonds every year uh, will just, you know, be a good alternative to buying bonds in your, uh, in your retirement account. And then you can use your taxable money to buy I bonds, use your retirement money to buy stocks if you want to. Uh, the rates uh, I bond, uh, the rates on I bonds have two components. Uh, one is a fixed rate, and then you have an inflation adjustment. Um, the government will announce a new fixed rate uh, every year on um, May 1st and November 1st. So here where April, May 1st is coming up, they're going to announce another rate. Uh, the rate that they announce is for the new bonds that they, they sell after that date. Uh, once you buy the I bond, then you keep that fixed rate uh, for life, uh, more for up to 30 years anyway. So the, the bonds that I, the I bonds that I bought in 2001, uh, they had a 3% fixed rate. So I'm still enjoying that 3% fixed rate even today when the new bonds are, uh, are zero. Um, the fixed rate does not go to zero. So it's already zero, the current rates are zero. So the May 1st rate, uh, even, the general market uh, interest rates have come down and up, uh, it's likely going to be zero. So it's likely going to stay zero, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, I would say, unless we see some uh, movement uh, interest rate on the market. Um, so 
uh, besides the fixed rate, there is a uh, inflation adjustment. It changes in uh, six month cycles, goes by the CPI changes. Um, so they calculate the changes, CPI changes from March so to September. They use that change uh, in the November cycle, and then they calculate the CPI changes from September to March, and they use that uh, to the uh, in the May cycle. Uh, so basically, eventually you will get all the uh, CPI changes. So my bonds that I bought last year, uh, they're getting the uh, CPI changes uh, uh, between March and September, and then six months later, they were going to get the CPI changes from September to March. Uh, so uh, the CPI changes uh, can be negative. So there were some historical periods uh, during the six months, uh, it was negative. Um, but when it's added to the fixed rate, the composite rate does not go to zero. So even if the in inflation adjustment is negative, you're guaranteed to not go negative. And if the inflation uh, reverses, it, you know, it's, uh, let's say it's negative 2% in one period and positive 2% in next period, you're going to get zero in one period and you're going to get the full 2% uh, in the next period. So you're not going to have the offset. So that's a, a, a good uh, feature as well. So the current rate is 0% fixed, and then the inflation, uh, if I remember correctly, is 1.68. Uh, the next period uh, inflation adjustment uh, is probably going to be a little higher than that. Um, they're going to, uh, we're, we're, we're able to know uh, when the next CPI number comes, uh, probably next week. So uh, what's uh, the good feature of 0% uh, fixed rate uh, with inflation? Uh, that's because matching inflation is at least better than losing to inflation. So this chart shows the TIPS rate, uh, the Treasury Inflation Index bonds uh, since uh, 2020. So the blue line is a five-year TIPS rate. The maroon line is a 10-year. The green line is a 30-year. Uh, the solid black line is zero. You will see it has been under zero or below zero, uh, even for 30 years uh, uh, TIPS for, long, for, long, uh, for some time until earlier this year. Um, so if you buy a five-year TIPS, uh, it's below 1.5%, meaning that people with institutional investors with millions of dollars to invest, they're accepting prices such that they lose to inflation for 1.5% a year for five years. So over five years, they're going to lose 7.5% to inflation. Versus if you buy I-bonds, you're guaranteed to match inflation. For your $10,000 purchase, you're getting a much better deal than the, than the institutional investors with millions to invest. So that's why the government doesn't want to sell us I bonds. They want to sell tips to the institutional investors uh, for a higher price. Um, how can you own I bonds? Um, they're not available in IRA, so you have to use your taxable money uh, to buy it. Uh, you can buy it uh, with yourself as the owner, uh, or you can buy it with yourself as the primary owner and then another uh, secondary owner. Um, and then uh, you can buy the I-bonds with yourself as an owner and then somebody else as a beneficiary. Uh, the beneficiary uh, comes in only when you die. Or if you have a a uh, small business or a trust, you can buy that uh, I-bonds in the small business or in the trust name as well. Okay, the terms, uh, the terms of I-bonds is no redemption is allowed whatsoever in the first 12 months. So it's not even a, a, a early withdrawal penalty. They just don't allow you to take your money out uh, after uh, within the first year. But after the first year, it's all up to you. The uh, term goes out to 30 years. You can choose to hold uh, up to 30 years. So I'm holding my 2001 I-bonds uh, until, you know, to, a full, uh, to the full 30 years because I got a, a very good rate. I'm not redeeming that. Um, 
but I also bought some lower rates uh, in previous years. And then I also redeemed uh, my my 0% bonds in previous years. So after uh, one year, you it's up to you. They cannot force you out, but you can choose to redeem uh, at uh, whatever point. Uh, if you redeem uh, within five years, you lose the last three months of interest. So the current interest, you know, 0% plus inflation, Inflation being, you know, between 1% and 2%, uh, losing the three months, it's like, what, 0.5%? Uh, it's not that much. So uh, the interest rate, interest is tax deferred. So while you hold the I-bonds, you're not paying tax each year. So again, my I-bonds bought in 2001, I'm not paying taxes until I redeem them. So when I redeem them, I pay taxes at that point of time. Um, uh, I pay federal tax, but I don't pay uh, state income tax because it's issued by the federal government. Um, if you redeem I-bonds in one year, and then you also contribute to 529 plan, you can say, I uh, put my I-bonds into the 529 plan, then you don't have to pay taxes uh, uh, in that year. And then the, five, the money goes into a 529 plan for college, uh, for college expenses. And eventually, if you use the money for college expenses and it becomes tax-free. So it, it can be a, a roundabout way to invest in bonds in a 529 plan because I-bonds are not available in 529. So you can buy I-bonds on the side and then at some point of time, uh, you know, redeem your I-bonds and put them into 529 plans. Um, when you contribute to 529 plan, the normal uh, limits still apply. So, uh, you know, $15,000 per giver to per recipient. So those, uh, those uh, limits st uh, still exist for 529 plans. Um, so annual purchase limit is $10,000 per calendar year per social security number as the primary owner. So if you're married, uh, you can have one person buy $10,000 per year as the primary owner with the other person as secondary owner, and then turn around, have the other person buy $10,000 a year uh, using them as the primary owner and then you as the secondary owner. And then you, if you have a trust account, you can buy another $10,000 uh, per year under the uh, trust name. So it's, these are based on calendar year. So if you're in November, you can buy uh, $10,000 in November. Come January, you can buy another $10,000 in January. Uh, a special thing uh, that you can use your tax refund uh, to buy another $5,000. So this is per tax return. So even if you have a joint return, you still can only buy $5,000. And you can only use your tax refund to buy. So if you owe, then there is no money to buy. If your refund is only $2,000, then you can only buy $2,000 worth. Oh, sorry. Um, So uh, if you normally only get a $2,000 refund, if you want to buy $5,000 worth, uh, there is a trick that you can pay them a little more to increase the refund. So the way to do that is you file an extension or you pay extra with, it, with an automatic extension. When you pay extra saying that uh, this money is paid because I'm filing an extension, then the money counts uh, toward the previous year. And then the money that you pay uh, will increase your refund for the previous year. And then uh, you, you put that onto your tax return. So your 2000 refund becomes your 5000 uh, refund. And then uh, you can buy, use your refund to buy I-bonds now. Um, so when you do that, basically the IRS will, uh, well, they already have your money and then they'll process your refund, use $5,000 to buy uh, I-bonds and then give you the additional money, to, uh, put it in your bank account. They send that money to the I-bonds department and that department will process your purchase. They'll print paper bonds and they actually come in the mail. And then, um, so you get these paper bonds. Uh, if you're 
uh, already buying the $10,000 from the government in the electronic form and you want to consolidate them and then you have to mail the paper bonds back in and tell them these are my paper bonds and this is my uh, account and please put them into my account. It's just a hassle but that's the way it is. Um, so the limit, uh, as I mentioned, you can't dump five hundred thousand dollars into it. But if you're young, you're you know investing, uh, think of it as an account. I mean, ten thousand dollars per person sounds low uh, as you know dumping your all fixed income into it. But if you treat it as account, uh, think about your IRA. You can only put in six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars. Here in I bonds, you can put in ten thousand dollars. So you know, not bad. Um, because you can only buy this from the government, uh, this, this is the only place, treasurydirect.gov, a uh, website set, set up by the government. Um, as government does things, it's not the most user-friendly website, uh, but it works. Um, they don't have a lot of incentive to give a very consumer-friendly website, but they, 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 they still have to do it. Um, so they do it. Um, so with this website, you can buy I-bonds, you can sell or redeem your I-bonds. Um, you do that by linking a bank account. Um, so if you're married, uh, each person will have their own login as the primary owner, and they see their own holdings there. You can, cheat, you can see uh, all the bonds that you bought uh, at government, including the bonds that you mailed in. Um, they don't send any monthly or annual uh, statements, uh, paper statement or electronic statement. If you want to see how much your bonds are worth, you have to go in there. Um, if, yeah, as I mentioned, if you have paper bonds and if you want to consolidate, you have to mail them in. And then if you redeem your bonds and they issue tax forms, um, they don't mail any tax forms, you have to remember you go in there and print the tax form yourself. I think they do send an email as a reminder, but uh, don't count on it. If you sold uh, bonds, set a reminder for yourself sometime in January, log into your account and then print your uh, 1099 forms there. So should you do it? Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, just think, you know, the people, you know, institutional investors uh, buying uh, buying tips, paying the higher prices, and here you're getting a way better deal, better deal uh, than you know all the banks and you know uh, institutional investors with a lot of money. Uh, and then they have to commit uh, for, uh, you know, 10 years, five years, 30 years. And here you only have one year commitment. Uh, if you see a better deal elsewhere, when the interest rates go higher, 0% uh, no longer cuts it, uh, tips are better, then you can sell your I-bonds and buy tips. Um, yeah, just uh, max out your annual limit. Uh, if you're single, $10,000. If you buy directly uh, from treasurydirect.gov, uh, and then $5,000 uh, from your tax return. If you're married, each person $10,000 plus another $5,000 um, your, uh, from your tax, return, uh, tax refund. And then uh, if you have a trust, you can set up another account to buy additional uh, $10,000 if you want to. Uh, further reading, again, uh, Bogle has wiki, has an uh, iBonds I entry. Uh, second link, uh, treasurydirect.gov, uh, get the information from the horse's mouth. Um, treasurydirect.gov has a video uh, guided tour. Uh, they can show you how to navigate the account. It helps uh, you know, if you're new to the website. Uh, paying taxes to buy iBonds, I have a blog post uh, tell you how to you know, pay the extra to the government, how to account for the extra payment that you made uh, in TurboTax and in uh, HNR block uh, tax software, and then how to request uh, the I-bonds uh, on your tax return. Um, and if you do use the tax return, uh, tax refund to buy your I-bonds, you, you have to mail them in, uh, treasurydirect.gov there. Uh, they have detailed instruction. They have a form that you have to fill out. They have the address, um, the, you know, where you put your account number uh, and all that. Uh, again, uh, many posts from uh, Bogle has forums. So I-bonds is a very popular topic on the forum. 
the sibling of I bonds. They're called a series EE savings bonds or double E bonds. Um, they're similar to I bonds. They're also issued by the government directly to us as uh, small investors. Um, so you have to get them from the government. Uh, if you hold these EE bonds for 20 years, you're getting 3.53% annual rate. Um, and compare that to 20 year treasury, there's the treasury are being sold to institutional investors and they're getting 2.23% as of yesterday. So if we buy the EE bonds and hold them for 20 years, we're getting 3.5 and they're getting 2.2. So again, a, a good deal uh, reserved only for us as uh, individual investors. Similar to I bonds, um, Again, not available in IRA because the government is not interested in uh, being an IRA custodian for us. So we can only use the tax, taxable money. Um, the E bonds are less uh, flexible as uh, I, than I bonds. Um, it only makes sense if we're holding uh, 20 years and exactly 20 years. Um, and similar to uh, I bonds, they also have an annual purchase limit. Exact, the, or, or, uh, similar to the I bonds purchase limit. So you're again, you're not able to dump $500,000 into EE bonds, even if you want to hold them for 20 years, you have to buy them over time. Um, so the rate, um, it's a quirky uh, arrangement. Um, you have a fixed rate for 20 years, uh, very, very low fixed rate uh, at 0.1%. And then uh, right at the 20 year mark, they make a one-time adjustment to make your value double from your initial purchase. So if you initially per, uh, bought $10,000 in double E bonds and you earned the 0.1% for 19 years and 11 months, right in the last month uh, when it reaches 20 years, your 1,000 uh, E bonds all of a sudden becomes uh, worth $2,000. So if you do the calculation, turning 1,000 into 2,000 in 20 years, uh, you're getting the 3.53% annual return. Um, so think of that as a huge uh, withdrawal, early withdrawal penalty. Uh, your uh, double E bonds uh, per $100 at 20 years is worth $200. If you happen to withdraw at 19 years, after holding 19 years, uh, they only give you $102. So you're losing almost half of your value just by withdrawing one year too soon. Um, so uh, compare that to 20 year treasury. So the red line 3.5%, the blue line is the 20 year treasury rate. You can see that since 2001, 2011, the 20 year treasury barely uh, beat uh, the e double E bonds only very briefly. Uh, you know, in the, the very deep uh, coronavirus periods, the double e, uh, the uh, twenty-year treasury uh, went as low as one point zero percent when the double E bonds were getting effectively three point five percent. So, if you bought double E bonds in twenty eleven, uh, it's already ten years. So, you've already uh, been halfway through your twenty-year journey while enjoying the good rate and then the 20 year treasury are getting their low rates. Uh, ownership types are uh, similar to I bonds, not available in IRA. You can do it uh, you know, just as an individual owner or you can own it with somebody else as a secondary owner or you can own it with somebody else as a beneficiary. So the beneficiary will get the money when you die or if you have a, a business or a trust, you can put the double E bonds in the business or trust name as well. Uh, the terms, uh, again, similar to I bonds, uh, nothing allowed uh, within the first year, and you don't want to with withdraw in the first year anyway, because you want to hold for 20 years. Uh, you can withdraw uh, before 20 years. Again, you don't want to. Um, and after 20 years, you're going to continue to earn that 0.1% again. Uh, you don't want to do that. So the only viable thing for us is just you buy the double E bonds, you hold it uh, for 20 years, and then uh, you redeem uh, after you get the one-time adjustment. Um, throughout the 20 years, you're not paying any tax. When the 20 year comes, you redeem and you pay the tax at that point. Uh, you pay federal, but you don't pay state. 
uh, purchase limit. Um, so there is a purchase limit very similar to I bonds. Uh, the limits are separate between I bonds and E bonds. So if you already maxed out on your I bonds, like uh, Miriam was contemplating, you can also max uh, out your okay. double E bonds as well. Uh, similar $10,000 per. Huh? Did you uh, turn it off? Uh, $10,000 uh, per social security number uh, as a primary owner, and then $10,000 per trust uh, uh, per calendar year. And then uh, there is not that extra $5,000 using tax refund. So your tax refund can only go to I bonds. Uh, there is no way to use the tax refund to buy double E bonds. Again, the double E bonds, think of it as another account. Uh, it's higher than your uh, annual IRA contribution. So after you max out all the taxable, uh, your tax deferred accounts and uh, Roth accounts, uh, you can buy additional uh, I bonds and double E bonds uh, from the government. Um, again, if you already have the Treasury Direct uh, .gov account to buy I bonds, you use the same account to buy double E bonds as well. Uh, in the same account, you hold both. Uh, you can buy, you can check your holdings, redeem, and print your tax form just like you know, I bonds. Um, should you do it? Um, 20 years, just that's the only question. Can you hold it for 20 years? Uh, because if you don't hold it for 20 years, you get nearly nothing. Um, and so it's not as flexible, unlike I-bonds. After one year, you can redeem any time. There are better opportunity, you just uh, go elsewhere. E-bonds, if you buy them, uh, you know, you, you're committed to holding for 20 years. Um, so if you're younger, um, you can build a ladder as a, as a pension. So let's say you're 40 this year, you buy a double E bonds, uh, you know, $10,000 uh, this year. And when you're 60, you can redeem $20,000, uh, 60. Well, next year you're 41, you buy again, you do redeem the bonds that you bought at 41 at 61. So you can continue that. Um, let's say you stop at age 60. So the, the double E bonds that you bought 60 at age 60, you redeem them at age 80. Um, so I wanna say because the double E bonds, they pay the 3.5%, it's not linked to inflation. So in today's rates, they're expected to beat inflation, but if let's say inflation gets to 4% and you're getting the 3.5%, then you still lose to inflation versus I bonds. If you bought I bonds at 0%, uh, even if inflation goes to 4%, you're still you know, matching inflation. You're not losing to inflation. Uh, so here I listed the 20 year uh, treasury yield, it's 2.23%. The 20 year tips uh, uh, yield is negative 0.11%. So that means the, you know, for an institutional investor, uh, when they're deciding whether they buy the uh, regular treasury or they buy the tips, they're expecting say inflation over the next 20 years at say 2.3%. So if they're correct, then your double E bonds will be, you know, handily beat uh, inflation by 1.2%. But if they're wrong, uh, as I mentioned, if inflation turns out to be, you know, 6%, then your double E bonds will lose lose to inflation. But you're doing better than, you know, nominal regular uh, treasury at 2.23 because if uh, inflation goes to 6% and they're losing big time and you're losing, you know, uh, less than that. So critical thing, uh, if you consider buying e-bonds, is just to remember to redeem at 20 years. If you redeem or sooner than that, you, you lose out. If you redeem later than 20 years, then, then your uh, double e-bonds are earning 0.1% while the regular 20-year treasury are earning whatever the, the rate at that time. Um, Want to further research this? Uh, Bogle has wiki has an entry. Uh, Treasurydirect.gov has the information, the official words on double E bonds, and then uh, search on the forum.